coming to end <laughs> Ron, I don't see Betsy. It's Gail. I don't see Betsy. No, I don't. Let's just wait a minute. Thanks. There you are. Uh, hey, Betsy. Welcome. <laughs> so, um, I think we can get going. So I'd like to welcome everyone to the hybrid planning board meeting of December 12th. And right now I'd like to take a call to order. Ms. Creighton. Here. Ms. Delicio and Ms. Foley both sent me an email that they are sick to me. Ms. Grolme. I'm here. Ms. Tenney. Here. And I'm here. So we have a four member and that constitutes quorum. I'd like three members and guests to be recognized by the chair if they wish to speak, and this meeting is being recorded. So, first item up is acknowledge receipt of correspondence, and then we received a letter from Lorraine Iavoni on eleven thirty. At this time, I'd like to take any public comments to the board for the limited amount of time. Would anyone from the public like to speak? Okay. So moving things around, we have um, at seven o'clock, we have called for two, three public hearings. Um, at seven o'clock, We'll talk about those, but we don't have enough members to vote on any of the special permits tonight. So I'm taking some items out of order to um, before the seven o'clock hour. And the first item I'd like to take is the Board of Health proposed regulation comments that were distilled. And um, Betsy, you did not get a chance to do that. I did not. Can you hear me? Yes. I did not get a chance to distill those because I was working on the two decisions for the um, marinas. So I will get to that for the next meeting. Okay, thanks. Um, so the next item I would take out of order is the 3A uh, action plan form review. Betsy, any uh, progress on that? Um, I had a meeting with Greg and also uh, a short discussion with Sarah Malish about it. And I am working on that and um, anticipate that um, it will be done probably within the next two weeks. The board is not meeting until I think a month from now. Right. Um, so um, you can review it for your next meeting. It has to be in by the end of January. Thank you. Any comments from the board on that? No. So uh, with the uh, with the leaving of Gary Gilbert, uh, three liaison uh, positions have opened up, and I'd like to just fill them in just until the um, new um, person gets elected to the planning board. And those three positions are um, 
uh, one liaison with the building inspector, and um, at, I, I've asked Sarah Creighton to take that on. Any issues with that? No, Sarah? that's fine. On, uh, we need a liaison to the ZBA, and since uh, Chris has been working with Sarah on recodification, I've asked Chris to take that on. Sure. Thank you. And then there's an opening for the Library Board of Trustees liaison position. Anyone interested in that? I can take it. This is just an interim thing, right? Until we get the meeting. We can do it, sure. Okay. Laura, thank you. Sure. Um, So the next item I have, um, I've delayed the traffic study report. He should be giving us a presentation at 730. Um, he will be, he will, I just talked with him. He'll be on, um, he'll be ready between 7 and 715. Okay, great. Thank you. Ron, uh, this is Christine. I'm here. Okay. Okay. Uh, um, and I, I have had my hand raised for a bit, and I just did want to make a comment. I mean, just going through some of the 3A background information, there is a footnote on our, um, the town's, there's been some kind of a change to our numbers of units of data. I was wondering if the town has officially received a letter from the state and why there's a footnote on the website. It's dated 1021. Um, Betsy, can you answer that? I can't answer that. Is Greg on? I'll find out the answer, but I can't answer that right now. Great, thanks. And so then the other thing I was just, you know, browsing other communities and I'm concerned that the planning board is not taking the lead on this. I understand what the state requires, the CEO of the community, but every other community um, it's the planning board, the planning department taking this and taking charge and getting input from other communities. So I am concerned. I mean, obviously we need input from everyone, but um, Betsy's an interim person, Sarah Mellish. I mean, we are elected officials. We are the people in charge of zoning. So, you know, taking charge and oh. filing this form is one thing, but um, we as a planning board should be doing this work. We should not be farming this out. Obviously, Betsy needs to help us, but we should be driving this bus. So I just need to put that on record that we need to take this back and take control of this. This is zoning. This is our lane, and we're in charge of it. So I don't know why. I mean, Sarah Mellish is in part of part of this at this point. I mean, obviously, the ZBA and FinCom all needs to be put input, but we as a board need to be driving this conversation. I think the select board was looking into forming a task force on this. Um, I don't know if that happened yet, but I, I think there was some discussion on getting other uh, boards involved. Um, Ron, the bottom line is this revolves around zoning. We should be doing what we need to do to figure out what zoning makes sense for us. We are the zoning board. This is our charge. Laura? We have a professional planner. We're not farming this out. This is the professional planning staff giving us assistance in preparing the form, which he's perfectly competent to do. We'll look at it as a board. We'll have a chance to comment and then we'll, we'll file it. And I'd like to request that we get back to an agenda that we can follow and not have conversations just scattered. We should all be able to make comment, but let's please stick to the agenda and um, about this My hand was raised during the agenda, Laura. It wasn't recognized, and I don't want it to be brushed over. Okay, the the, uh, the agenda item was to on the form, but we can move forward on um, how we want to proceed. We'll put it on the agenda for next time. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we still have time, so I think what we would start uh, now, um, Sarah, if you wanted to take some time to talk about our next proposed work plan for Springtown meeting um, um, and your thoughts on that. And if we can get through some of it tonight, that'd be great. Uh, otherwise, uh, at 7 o'clock, we'll move on to the... Uh... Um, do you want to, can I share my screen? Yes. Uh, where are you? Oh, I have to be signed in. Sorry. 
don't see you. I'm not signed in. Uh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Okay. Just I'm not. Um, well, I think I can actually, I, I can do it without sharing my screen. So um, we, uh, I actually think that, that um, a work plan for any of the actions that we're taking, perhaps related to the prior discussion is useful. And so I laid out for us um, the schedule, um, I should just share my screen. Um, the schedule of um, meetings prior to the next town meeting. So working backwards, uh, town meeting is April 3rd. I checked with Greg and the warrant would need to be finalized on March 6th at, at the select board meeting, which puts us with a public hearing at the latest on February 27th. I'll put this in the planning board packet, um, which means the, um, we need to post a hearing on February 6th. Um, that hearing could be more encompassing than what we finally present, can't be less. So, um, so I propose that on the 13th of February, we would finalize topics for the public hearing um, and that we would have a special working session if needed on January 30th. Uh, January has five Mondays just so. Um, Lucky us. Yes. Um, and then I also proposed a couple of subcommittee uh, mm -hmm. meetings of Chris and me posted meetings to just discuss proposals to the board. And then working back even further to our next meeting, January 9th, um, is that we make a decision about sort of go, no go, or change um, our position on the articles. Um, so I uh, you know, we've passed, uh, successfully passed at town meeting four of the 12 that we had proposed. Two, I think, are administrative, um, adult entertainment in section 12, and um, six, the remaining six are what I called policy changes. So I think, personally, I think it's probably mm -hmm. optimistic to try to do all of those at a annual town meeting, but I think we had talked about the administrative ones being um fairly straightforward mary has identified a number of typos in the existing bylaw which we can and should um address um in the in the town meeting and then perhaps we can talk in january um about um what i'm what i'm proposing a subcommittee meets and makes some recommendations back to the full board um on how to proceed with um the others, those others being residential conservation cluster amendments, a new senior housing bylaw, amendments to the non-conforming section. And I say that because they were amendments, but they were really, they were presented as a rewrite. Um, a new section for ADUs, the ADU removal of the 1990, 1984 double lot and parking requirements, changing the parking requirements and the family living quarters for family members in addition to an employee. So those are the topics that we would be talking about. Um, so I think it's a pretty aggressive <laughs> schedule. I personally have a hard time. I don't think that um, select board will want us to take up all of those policy changes, but perhaps we can select a limited number um, or a limited one or two. But I think we can do that. Um, so I guess, um, I would like to ask for a motion to um, have Chris and me continue as the subcommittee and that we would post some meetings um, uh, and that people pencil in a January 30th working session on this topic. So moved. Is there a second? Seconded. Okay, well, if you want to have some discussion. Any discussion? Roll call vote, Laura. Yes. Yes. Sarah. Yes. Vice Chair votes yes. Christina. Christina. Oh, Christina. Um, yes. I guess I'm a little concerned about the transparency of this. Um, I don't know, understand why we just can't do this in an open meeting, why we need you and Chris to drive this. Could you just help me through that? Well, I did, um, I, I'm sorry, you can't see the sheet that I had here. Uh, 
passed out. I do have um, a subcommittee with a posted meeting on the week of January 9th and the week of February 6th as proposals. So I uh, agree that they should be posted meetings and certainly any member of the board can come. Um, so we will you know, schedule them at a time that is a logical time for people to be able to come. I just think it's too much work to take up in our regular meetings. And the idea would be that Chris and I would, as we've done before, come up with some straw proposals um, and uh, recommend them to the board for discussion. So the final decision rests with the board, of course. Um, so the other piece that I think is important is to remember that as of now, we have voted to move forward those remaining eight articles. And so therefore, you know, whether we, now the time frame has changed, but we should um, either move them forward or revise our statement of action. Mm -hmm. Right, and so, I think the public hearings all need to be redone. So absolutely, I mean, the, so the public from hearings, the public to make sure that they're still on board too, and make sure that we hear any further comment. I guess I, I'm just a little concerned about just high level conversation. Are we still involving Borowski? Um, Can everyone on the planning board? Is there a quorum issue if the entire board wanted to attend? I guess those are just my high level concerns. I don't think there's a quorum issue if we post a meeting. Okay. I'm fine with it then, yes. Okay. Laura? I had the same question as one of Christina's, which is whether uh, we would have Bobrowski or some land use lawyer involved, as I think we all have been working on this a long time, but and have a great familiarity, but none of us are land use lawyers. Right. So the only thing I, I at least from my, pers my opinion, and this is strictly my opinion, is that we would confine our work in this next phase to the matters that we've already talked about. We wouldn't be creating new, with the exception of some uh, edits, you know, fixing typos and that kind of thing. And therefore we have had um, the input of Mark Bobrowski on the substance of those um, in terms of presenting them at town meeting. That's another discussion we could talk, have. So, and then we also do have town council who can help us with. Right, and part of the reason I'm asking is there's some original language he put forward a long time ago. We debated it. We made some changes. He did review all of the yes, articles. Yes, he's reviewed it. So I'm not saying we, we've um, you know, varied from that necessarily, but if some of the questions are, does having you know no five acre minimum for RCCs or something make us different than other towns? It might be helpful to have some context about, you know, here's what I've seen in other towns possibly um, Betsy could provide that kind of context too. I don't know, but I just think outside of us as a planning board it might be helpful to have a little more context about what elements of it are useful, typical, that kind of thing. Well, then one of the things I had proposed and I took it off the list, but we certainly could add it is for the January 9th meeting, people think about what questions have come to mind um, and then we can try to get the answers to those questions or weigh, weigh them as we discuss this. So I think that's a good idea. We still have a contract with Mr. Bobrowski and there's still some funding available. So I don't think we're precluded from right. contacting the community. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I, I'm, I'm, my proposal doesn't indicate one way or the other. Mm -hmm. So, okay, we have a motion. Okay, so the motion passed five zero. Okay. All right, thanks. Is that it, Sarah, on that? <laughs> yep, I will um, post this uh, for our next meeting and um, add in the homework of all of us to think about what issues have come to mind since then, so we can kind of consolidate a list. And then um, the proposal for the next meeting is that we decide on a go, no go, or change on administrative section 12, adult entertainment, and I propose non-conforming use because in my mind, that's an easy discussion, but maybe it's not. And then we take up the policy ones, which non-forming use is a policy on the policy list. I just picked one. Deal you know, with it. Ask a clarifying this. question. Yeah. Are you suggesting that we all get together and say which one of these on the policy list we would bump up? And then um, I think that we can, that could be a discussion. I think Chris and I, the idea is that Chris and I would make some recommendations, but certainly input 
is most welcome. One of we can have some of that discussion later tonight. In the short time frame, we need to get the simplest ones mm -hmm. up. Well, I'm actually thinking we might be able to have that discussion maybe later after this parking study. Okay. We want to come back to it tonight. Yeah, and I'm working on a memo to the board from me about senior housing. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about um, what senior housing entails, what the various options are, why it's important to allow it in every zoning district and not just in some. So, um, well, as soon as that, it'll probably take some time to do it, but we've done it, put it onto SharePoint so they can be aware of it. Great. Okay. Ten minutes. You want me to want to talk about those things then? Yeah, we could. We could talk about um, uh, the items. Somebody has their hand up. Betsy has her hand up. Oh, Betsy, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Um. So under forty A section six, there's a provision that basically says the board of selectmen are supposed to finalize the warrant and they provide a list of articles that the board is supposed to be um, holding hearings on. So it seems like the time frames here are very tight. So if somebody put in a petition article, say the last day of um, what was allowed, um, the planning board may not have enough time to hold the hearing prior to town meeting. That would be for petitioners articles, not for zoning, right? Um, well, it could be a petitioners article that's a zoning article. Uh, so uh, well, I don't, the, the question I asked Greg was when would the um, warrant close for, um, maybe Greg can answer this, petitioners articles may have a sooner deadline. Greg is- Greg, did you have, can you help us out? Um, yeah, so the petition articles are due um, 60 days prior to okay. um, April 3rd. So they, they will be due the 1st of February. That's, okay. by, our, that's by our town charter. Okay. It's, a by, it's a bylaw. Okay, so then the Board of Selectmen are supposed to... Okay, so I suppose that could work. Um, but there is a provision in Mass General Law that basically says the Board of Selectmen is supposed to hand a list of um, articles for the planning board to hear um, to the planning board, and then the planning board holds a public, advertises and holds a public hearing. So um, I but, guess but, what happens is this, some of these are going to have to happen before the warrant closes. Has that been the protocol in the past? Yes. Yes, so, but if they're if they're initiated by the planning board, the planning know, board can hold the hearing any time. Correct. Right. Um, okay. Okay. It just is a very tight time frame here. Thank you. Understood. Um, Sarah, did you want to talk about which ones? Um, well, maybe we can. Um, I think we. Uh, <clears throat> it, it would be my, my recommendation um, that we uh, proceed with section 12. Um, I think it's ready to go, maybe in typos. Um, and that we move that forward to April town meeting. That's the adults. No, that uh, section 12 is the administrative changes. Okay. Um, so I, don't, um, I guess I could make a motion to that effect and then we can discuss it. So I'll, I'll move that we um, actually move section 12 administrative changes forward to the April town meeting at the April town meeting. Um, so that's my motion. I'll just have a second that. Okay. Motion's been made and seconded. Is there any discussion? Um, my point is I think it's the uh, kind of final, re re you know, tidying up. Um, we did renumber it, so that's good. Section it was section seven, now section twelve. Um, but there were some 
just administrative things that got tidied up in that um in the new draft and i think it's pretty straightforward i don't think it's a, a highly debatable um issue i don't I, ha I certainly haven't heard any um uh complaints about it but we certainly it'd be great to have betsy look at it with fresh eyes um and uh we could do that in advance of a public hearing so motion <laughs> made and second do any further discussion so, uh, Laura. So the um, administration section you said contains some typos, but then down at the bottom we've got other typos and other administrators. Right. That so separate. separate. So one of the things that, um, if you recall, there was a amendment to the motion on town meeting. Oh, you were not town meeting. I wasn't there. There are a couple of them, and then there uh, Mary has identified a number of typos in the um, sections that we were not taking up at town meeting. So we should do those as well. Right. And we're going to yeah. try to do those separately so that we can get the typos. Right, separate and understandable for people and then talk about the yeah. content. Of course, so, these could all be in the same article. We could have them in the same article or not. We How we format it is yeah. a matter of strategy, I think. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Any further discussion? It's been a Roll discussion. Roll call vote. Yeah, I, this is Christy. I'm just jumping in because you can't. It, doesn't it just make sense to have this cleaned up and then vote on it as when it's cleaned up? Why are we voting on it if it's not clear? No, my point is only we're voting that we would move it forward. We're not, this isn't a final vote to put it on the warrant because you're right, it needs, we want Betsy to look at it, we want to read it again, we want to, but but as opposed to tabling it. Which, this is a vote to just move it forward. I, I, okay. I mean, I think we should clean it up and have the actual document before we move it forward. Okay, or maybe it's an intent to move it forward if I changed my motion to, to indicate an intent to move it forward, to spend, to spend really, the time to clean it up and then to put it on a public hearing. Exactly. I mean, we didn't spend the time before. We provided a sloppy document. Get it right. Get it clean, and then move it forward. I just don't like these messy documents. I mean, just do the work and get it right. So, is there a second on the yeah. amendment to have the intent to move? Sure. I'm sure that. Okay. So, just on the intent. Any further discussion? Uh, roll call. Um, Laura. Yes. Chris. Yes. Sarah. Yes. Chair, yes. Christina. I'm abstaining. <clears throat> okay. And the second one I would move 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 to intend to move it forward to the public hearing and then to the town meeting would be adult entertainment. That's um something we need to do. Again, pretty straightforward. A second. Is there a second on that? Second that. Any discussion on moving the intent to move adult entertainment, moving it to the LC as well. Matt. Regulate adult regulate, entertainment. Regulate. <clears throat> Roll call vote. Yes. Who has a hand up? Betsy did. Betsy, go ahead. Um, so where would the adult entertainment um, district be located? It's already only allowed in the LCD. Okay. But it has no regulations currently. So you can do whatever you want. Roll call vote on the intent to move. Move forward on adult entertainment. Yes. 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 Chair, motion to yes. Christina. Yes. Okay. Um, so, the right now? Or, well, uh, the other one probably takes a little longer than two minutes. So, we'll, we'll hold on that one for a moment. We'll come back to it at the end. Okay. Um, Two minutes left. Does, has anyone read the minutes of 926 or 104? And I... Oh. I did. So move to approve the minutes of 104. As written. The motion's been made and seconded. Is there any discussion? I was leaving my notes about things I wrote down. There's one that I think I wasn't at, but I'm forgetting which of the two meetings it was. So whichever one I wasn't at, I won't vote on. All right. Okay. Any okay. further discussion? Move to approve. Uh, yes. 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 
Yes. Yes, for the one you were yes, saying. Yes, I was aware of that. <laughs> yeah. Approval of the minutes. And Christina Bell. Yes. Yes. Okay, minutes approved. And then, oh, do we approve both of them? 10, 9, 26? Yes. Okay. The motion was for both. both. And yes. the board okay. is just. I think it says which one I was present at. I apologize. I don't have it in front of me. I can't remember. Uh, you were present at the 926. Okay. Okay, 7 o'clock. So, um, with Christina being here, I think we have enough to vote on the floats. But I don't think with Mary not here and um, Sarah um, recusing herself, we don't have enough to um, vote on the Manchester Parks and Rep. Is I do have a question? question about that. Yes. I'm actually looking at section nine of chapter 40A and it says a special permit issued by a special permit granting authority shall require a two thirds vote of the boards uh, with more than five member, a vote of at least four members of a five member board and a unanimous vote of a three member board. So right now, aren't we a six member board? So two You're a seven member board. So I think Greg got a clarification on this. Um, All right. Greg or Betsy, did you want to explain? My understanding is that Greg got a determination from legal counsel and that five uh, votes were required for a special permit. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Oh, one other question. Sorry. Yeah. Is uh, and if we fail to act, we take no action. Am I correct that if we take no action within ninety days, it's constructively approved? Once we close the. Public. No, that's not correct. You have not closed the public hearing. You've continued okay. the public hearing to date certain. From the time okay. you close the public hearing, you have ninety days to get a written decision to the town clerk. Okay, thank you. Christina. So I was just curious um, that you got opinion on the voting requirements. I think Mary had a question about the agenda. Do we get a legal opinion on that? On the agenda? And posting of. Um, there was um, a legal opinion from town council, which I thought was put in your packets. Greg. I did not see it. Um, yes, uh, what Betsy just said is correct. So legal counsel did review the requirements for the hearing notice and reviewed it against uh, the requirements in 40A and issued an opinion that I, I passed along. I believe it is in the agenda packet um, that indicated that it was, uh, that the hearing notice was adequate. Okay, so so um, sorry to interrupt, but um, the Audi from Audi from MAPC is on um, the Zoom meeting. Oh, he can hear now. Good. Okay, never mind. So Audi from MAPC is uh, available. Okay, so uh, again, a change of plans with uh, Christina here and. Um, we were able to vote on these floating docks. So uh, uh, Audie may, we have to put her up, off a little bit just until at least we get through these. <clears throat> I'd like to open the continued public hearing on a special permit application um, for the Manchester Parks and Rec. This is to construct a youth athletic field with 25 parking spaces on the site of the old burn, burn dump at 156 to 165. At this time, since we don't have a quorum to vote this, I'd like to continue the public hearing until our next meeting, which is on January 9th. At seven o'clock. At seven o'clock. Do we need a vote of the board or? <clears throat> so I'm going to move that we continue the public hearing until January 9th at seven o'clock. Second. Second. 
Uh, roll call vote. Uh, chair says yes. Abstain. You're yes. abstaining. Yes. yes. Laura says yes. Christina. Christina, you're on mute. Sorry, yes. Thank you. So at this time, I'd like to open the continued public hearing on the special permit application for Crocker Boatyard. The Harbor Advisory Committee met on December 7th. The meeting was attended by me, Sarah Creighton, and town planner Betsy Ware. I acknowledge the application, the applicant in attendance, and do you have and do you have any comments at this time? I will turn to Betsy to advise the planning board on the results of the Harbor Advisory Committee meeting. So the Harbor Advisory Committee, I got their notes today around noonish. I um, asked uh, Gail to put them on the um, um, in the SharePoint, and um, they voted um, to approve Crocker's Boatyard. Um, for the expansion of the dockage area. Okay, thank you. Uh, and now that I have their notes, I would suggest that I may add some additional language into the decision um, that kind of strengthens the decision. Um, for example, on the first and second page, add that the Harbor Advisory Committee commented and this is what their comments were. Okay, um, thank you. Um, any comments from the planning board? <clears throat> Uh, Sarah has a question. Um, this is a question for uh, consultant Ms. Thank you. Susan, thank you. Um, when you um, presented about the Chapter 91 license, you indicated, and I looked it up, that there were two pathways for the same structure. One is if it's a, related to a water related. Um, use and the other would be if it's related to something else. Um, and is that something else like condos that would then have docks out front? Or what's the something else? What's the other path? So if you have a use that includes any. Maybe you stand, can, can the audience here? <laughs> Under the Chapter 91 regulations, there are two types of uses that they define water dependent uses, which are uses that are. That need to be on the water mm -hmm. and depend on the water for their location. And then the other uses are non water dependent uses. They don't need to be on the water. Sometimes you might have a residential development that has docks, so it has some water dependent uses and some non water dependent uses. But the Chapter 91 regulations would define that whole project as a non water dependent use, even though there's water dependent components. Okay. And there are different standards for water dependent versus non water dependent. Okay, so then my question is for Betsy. Um, is it possible to convince to have a um, piece of these, either of these uh, permit, these special permits, um, say that they are um, approved or relevant or whatever the right word is, um, so long as they qualify as water dependent uses within the chapter 91 definition? My thought is, and sometime in the future, um, the boat yards, which I think we are trying to encourage the business of boat yards, the servicing of boats for the town, and those uses might become waterfront condos. And it seems to me then we'd want to take another look at the use because that premise, at least that's important to me for supporting the, the broad uh, business interests, small business interests, and uh, water service—you know, water service interests—are important and therefore would change. So, I guess my question for Betsy is: Would that be an appropriate addition to a special permit, or I guess for the board? 
applicant has a comment. I don't know. I don't see any problem with adding it as a condition of approval that and encouraging water dependent uses given the history of both of these properties. Um, it could be put in as um, a finding and um, it could also be put in as a condition. Yeah, okay. And if I may, the license itself will state that it's a water dependent use and any change to the use that's authorized under the license would require either an amended license or a new license. And if, if a change were to be a non-water dependent use, it would require a new license. Okay. So it's yeah. consistent. So to put that into our special permit is consistent with the, um, the um, chapter 91. Oh, Christina yeah. has her hand Christina. up. Christina. Yeah, I'm just gonna Thanks. Um, in the decisions, both of them, I didn't see anything um, addressing the public benefit. Um, so in the Crocker decision, um, one of the conditions was that, wait a minute, hang on a minute. Um, Number six. One of the conditions was that the Manchester by the Sea Lobster Fleet can use the expanded floating dock area off season. Um, and that they were going to contribute um, funding for design and fabrication of safety signs for paddleboard and kayakers in the harbor. Mr. Crocker. So, uh, conditions four and conditions six. Thank you, Betsy. Mr. Crocker, I have a comment. So I was thinking about that. I've been kind of tied up with some personal business. So I haven't really been focused on this. Um, what occurred to me today, uh, part of the deal with the fishermen was also, whenever possible, to maintain access to Morse Pier my tugboat does have ice breaking camp employees. I've also done that for the town, which I would continue to do as long as I have the tugboat. So are you suggesting that uh, in lieu of the helping the lobster fleet? No, I think in addition to. Okay. Well, you want to throw that in on the. Yeah. I also um, think. I'm sorry, I didn't get that. So I think the addition of the. Um, Condition of a uh, offer to um, use uh, the Crocker's tugboat to break up the ice um, and maintain access to the harbor in winter conditions, so long as the tugboat remains in the Crocker's boatyard fleet or something like that. Um, the last question. Yeah, I, I think I we should. The ice up until I lost my rudder. <laughs> and, and serviceable. Um, so the other thing is we might want to, uh, I mean, right now the lobster fleet is how many, do we want to limit that to a number, uh, you know, up to five boats or something like that, or up to, I mean, not I sure the lobster fleet. Is the one I okay. It's slowly gone down. Yeah. So you're not concerned that you're going to have a fleet of 30 or something. No, okay. Okay, Chris. Laura. I have some questions, and they're um, they come a few, and they're somewhat unrelated to each other, but just for clarifying. So, um, I agree with everything that's been said so far by the harbor, um, by our harbor master, um, Bion. He's not here tonight, is he? No. Uh, Bion's online, I think. Oh, is he? Uh, maybe not. Oh, yeah, he's online. He's a picture. Of him. Great. Um, so he's talked about the benefits to the harbor of these expansion and um, also um, the proposal, I forget if it was Crocker's or Manchester Marine, to um, fix the floats on the opposite side of the channel so that they're all not swinging. And is that something that we were looking to condition so that, uh, so that it would make the channel safer for all boaters? Didn't see That's it. in the Manchester Marine one. Okay, so we're just discussing crackers right now. Okay, or I don't know if it is in it, but it should be in it. Okay. Um, this question, I think, uh, these two questions, I think, apply to both. Um, 
if there is a harbor master plan at some point and that if these two proposals get approved and the harbor master plan um, happens later and there are findings that say that some adjustment needs to be made for the safety or the attractiveness of the harbor, whatever that might be. What do we do then um, in terms of, you know, if there are some findings at that point, I know I'm asking sort of a speculative question, but I'm just wondering because it's been brought up about, you know, the need for a harbor master plan. Did the, did the harbor board address that at all? I think so. The I mean, the plan is for a few years. I, don't think. Okay. I mean, these are pilings that are, Drilled, you know, or right. put into the yeah. So I think, I think this is the the chance to change it if we want to. Um, and my other question. So it sounds like that's a, uh, something that's on the longer term horizon. There was a, a a word in both of the decisions, draft decisions, regarding the um, that there's no negative environmental impacts on the um, on the floor or on uh, shellfish or marine life. And that wildlife habitats and other natural resources used are deemed um, uh, appropriate by the special permit granting authority, and that's us. Um, and we're not really in, we don't have the expertise to determine that. So uh, perhaps, Susan, could you tell us how that's determined? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's in your book uh, bylaw. <laughs> this is a finding that you have to make, but sure. uh, we did get approved by the Conservation Commission. Okay. And that is a topic of several of the resource areas. None of these projects are happening in shellfish areas anyhow. Okay. So okay. we're outside of the map shellfish areas. Great. And then the last question was um, for uh, the additional signage for safety for paddle boards and other paddlers. That sounds like a great idea. Was there anything else that was um, discussed by Bayan or the Harbor um, Board in terms of safety for the smaller vessels like paddlers that needs to be addressed. That I know of. Yeah. Um, so I raised that with the Harbor Committee and they didn't feel that there was a um, uh, need that could be addressed, nor did they think that this was going to increase traffic to the extent that it would cause significantly increase safety. It is something that I worry about. You add, you know, 10 more cars on the road, it makes it less safe for bicyclists and pedestrians, but it's sort of the same um, thought. So I guess I was, would suggest that um, in addition to funding that there be, you know, I think that the, the signage for kayakers is that there's always too many signs, but I do think that there are some key places where kayakers could have signs along a whole channel that says stay out of the channel mm -hmm. like kayakers there's a channel stay mm -hmm. out of it you know mm -hmm. avoid being run over something that's so I do think that there's something creative there that could be done that might save one person mm -hmm. you know like mm -hmm. you know help right. help mm -hmm. uh just I saw a situation last summer that was kind of a near disaster so so I do think that there's an opportunity for the for some education of people in hand craft. Yes. Yeah. But may also, I think the two projects combined are going to create a channel that people will be visible to people. Mm -hmm. Whereas right now, it's, you don't really know where it is. Mm -hmm. So I think that's going to help in terms of safety. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, thank you. Those are my questions. Uh, Christina, do you have any questions or thoughts? I do. Um, so I guess, you know, going back to we use this as you know our, our sounding or founding document our master plan it does call for a harbor master plan so this is the second time we're expanding this seems pretty significant um is there a reason why we're just not going ahead with the master plan greg if you're on buy on like when is this going to happen is there people is there funding needed like why isn't this happening i'm not really comfortable with going forward with this without this master plan? Well, it is it is moving forward. We've reached out to the Urban Harbors Institute. They are uh, providing the town with um, an estimate for what it would cost to do this. Harbor master plan will take a year to two years to complete. Um, that's pretty typical for projects of this nature. And uh, steps are being taken to 
uh, create one for the town. Any more comments or questions? Chris um, only. I have a question for Brian. Are there going to be any changes to the channel markings themselves as a result of this? So the only channel markings right now are the federally maintained ones. Uh, those will not change. Um, that doesn't mean that we can't, uh, through the Coast Guard, put in what are called private aids to navigation. That's what our swim buoys are. That's what the no-wake buoys are. Uh, that's what the two buoys marking Bowbell Ledge are. So uh, if the town determined that it would be wise to put in some smaller town maintained green and red channel markers, uh, we could. Um, to be honest with you, those would have been, would be more helpful uh, right now with a channel that isn't always well delineated. Um, it will be much, much more obvious uh, if these two projects move forward where the channel is. But we could put in buoyage if people determine that that would be helpful. Okay, thank you. Some more questions. Mm -hmm. um, the, I, I would like to actually see that the decision add um, one more condition, which is something along the lines of um, that uh, um, vehicles associated with this addition shall be parked on Crocker's Boat Yard and Manchester Marine, you know, uh, property and not on the public street. They'd be parked on on, on the Yacht Boat Club. Parking on Ashton Avenue, I can stand that there. doesn't mean people will park there. I know. <laughs> All the contractors in town park on Ashton. Yes, park uh, park that parking. And they have enough parking. It's <laughs> obvious, but so they're parking on the property as opposed to the public way. Yep. Ron, I have a follow up question. I mean, is it appropriate to put in this decision that no more expansion will happen until a complete Manchester Master Harbor Master Plan is complete? Does that sound reasonable, Betsy? Um, my concern is that if we don't get funding, um, then that could be the years could be pushed out so um we can get the funding at town meeting right so we don't have to rely on grants so uh, this is the second expansion without a plan there is concerns of public taking a plan i'm not really con convinced of the public benefit so i am concerned of this ongoing expansion without a plan thank you Becky, you have a comment on that? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I just, I just want to say that I, I don't think it's logical to say that money would be gotten at a town meeting and not anywhere else. I, I just think to say that we would be taking money um, is not appropriate. Thank you. Wouldn't uh, further expansion be subject to a special permit and mm -hmm. be reviewed by us again anyway? I'm um, just thinking uh, that you know, if we don't think we need to put that in as a condition as we will have the ability to condition it ourselves if another special permit for expansion comes our way. That's my thought. Chip, uh, Skip has his hand up. Skip, go ahead. Just the definition between expansion and maintenance if something happens and a storm yeah. wipes out the dock you need to to one life. yeah anything i mean just it, it to limit the two boyards i mean are there other for commercial i mean what we did in essex was we put it maybe one year more to learn more any new businesses in town while we figured out some zoning um to you know, put a special condition i mean i, I don't know if it's within your Right or not, but I just the definition between expansion and maintenance mm -hmm. should be clearly defined in that decision. Um, under the chapter and one license and the special yes. permit and the order condition, we asked for a reconfiguration about 
So you can reconfigure within that zone. You can't expand. We can't expand under the Chapter 91 license either, unless we go back and get Even the reconfiguration would be subject to. The recon no, we, we can reconfigure. We have to send a letter to the, the waterways, but you cannot add to the square footage of the flows. So you can reconfigure if you need to or want to, but you can't add. So the, oh. to Laura's point, if there's if the harbor plan does uh, find so that some reconfiguration is uh, needed and could be done within the existing pilings, then it could be done. I was incorrect, I guess. Yeah, it could be done, yes. Yeah, I mean, it's a little technically. Okay. What about uh, other changes to the upland on land facilities? Whatever restrictions, I, that's not. I'm just making sure. Just not subject to this. No, not um, subject to this. No. So okay, um, we're done with questions. Yeah, I'm sorry. Can I ask one more question? Who? Is there, a, is there a next step with the chapter 91 or who determines that the public benefits are appropriate? Is that Mass DEP or, you know, what's the next? So we haven't applied for the chapter 91 license yet, um, but we soon have approved the planning board to do that. And they they look at public purpose. And their, their primary concerns for water dependent use projects are navigation, safety, mm -hmm. emotion, public benefit. So we will look at that. And there's public comment period uh -huh. and the public notice that's issued in the local newspaper so people can comment on it. Okay. I guess my, uh, I think that that's all reasonable, certainly, the process. Um, and I think the signage for paddlers is a great benefit. I, um, I, I wonder whether through the harbor master process or, you know, are there other things that we can continue to do to make the harbor safer and more comfortable for the smaller boats as we increase the um, larger boat traffic. And I'm not saying that all has to happen in this project, but we should be mindful of it. So I I don't know if the chapter 91 process will reveal more or there will be more demands made at that point, but you know, I, I think the, the signage is a is a good benefit. I don't know if that's going to be deemed, you know, is that sufficient? I don't know. <laughs> so the Brian, Brian, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so the the single biggest thing that's going to help the paddle boarders be safe uh, after signage, which any information that we can get to the uh, these boaters who are uh, in most cases entry level boaters, is education, education, education. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess I, I might suggest that on the signage we we recommend it and um, steer them towards it. Uh, through maybe a link on the signage. So uh, just just throwing that out there, I, I, education is the real answer to making them safe. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Betsy? Um, I just have a comment in that um, any improvement that they do are tied to the plans and anything beyond that, they have to come back to the planning board. So um, to address Christina's comments, they can't expand or do anything beyond what it was in their application. Okay, so let's moving forward. Um, this project has been endorsed by the CONCOM, the Harbor Master, unanimous vote by the Harbor Advisory Committee, and we've certainly vetted with conditions on the decision. This, this, we need all five members to vote in the affirmative for this to move forward. So at this point, I would like to take a straw poll of members on moving this forward. Great. Um, I will vote yes. Penny? Yes. Chair will vote yes. Christina? My concern was not addressed. Excuse me? My concern was not addressed. This is the second time that this has come in front of the board. I wanted some kind of, and it's not just conditions on a new special permit. This is the second time the expansion has happened. I feel like this is not our place. We need a harbor plan. Um, I'm concerned about the expansion. So 
Betsy, mm -hmm. I understand that nothing can happen. I, I, that's really clear to me. My point is I don't want any more expansion to come in front of us at all until a harbor plan is done. And I'm not hearing that. Yeah. Um, we did have a private doc, at least one, pri three, two private docs since I've been on the board, which represent an expansion of harbor activities. So I think that we've made a precedent and, um, and I think we can expect that other um, private entities would come before us, these are private. So um, in the absence of, um, as Skip suggests, you know, a moratorium on um, harbor expansion, um, it seems to me that we don't have the authority to condition a permit on a plan that the applicant has no um, ability to affect when that plan is going to happen. No, and I think you actually nailed it right there. They were private, and this is commercial, and that's my concern. I feel like there's a... Well, Greg has taking advantage in a commercial, not taking advantage. I, and I'm, that's not how I mean. I think this actually could be a benefit, but I just feel like this is the second time that this, these marinas have expanded and we don't have a plan as the town. That's my concern. So it's just specifically for these two marinas, not the town in general. I just want to get that they're not expanding until we have a Harbor master plan. That's my concern. Mr. Fetter Spiel. So just to add a little more um, specificity to the Harbor Master Plan, the select board has voted to proceed with such a plan. Um, the proposed FY24 budget will have funding um, recommended to the voters to approve, to move forward with the plan. Um, so the idea is to move forward this, this winter um, and then get the funding at, at the spring annual town meeting and to continue forward. Christina, will that satisfy you? I just feel like we're always playing catch up. I just don't understand why we're always three steps behind. So I, no, it really doesn't. Like, I guess this is the second time this is expanded and I just don't see an end. And I wanted a commitment that there was a pause until we finish this and I'm not hearing that. I mean, it's great. Thank you, Greg, for ex expanding upon that but that's not what I was looking for. So what would it take to change your mind on this? I really want to hear from both marinas that they have no intention in coming back until this Harbor Master Plan says that they think that's a good idea. I think we've pushed the envelope here. I don't think the public benefit is great. I think it's fine. I don't think it's amazing, but I think these things should be laid out in more detail before we as a planning board go forward. I don't think it's really our space. Um, that's my concern. Right. So it's certainly in your purview to say that no further expansion will take place going forward until a master plan is in place. That doesn't prevent you from approving what's before you, but you certainly could stipulate that. Well, that's what I just asked and I kind of got shot down. So we're taking the straw and I said I didn't, you know, I wasn't appeased with that. So. Right. Would that need to be part of the special permit decision or could it be a side letter um, uh, that was a compendium or, or um... it could be either way. And I want to be clear, if there's some damage and you want to rebuild, A, okay, like that's not my point, but like rebuilding and expanding to this extent to me, I feel like the town needs a master plan. I do think it's a good idea. I just think we're kind of shooting in the dark without a plan. And like I said, we're playing catch up. If we want this vibrant harbor community, we should have a plan before we start approving things and putting in docks. And I mean, we're talking about putting in more docks and applying for more grants. So it's just, we're doing, doing, doing without a plan. Becky, you have a comment? Yes, I do. Thank you, Ron. Um, don't any plans have to come before you anyway. So the planning board would, 
I guess my question is um, to be saying that you cannot do any more expansion without having an understanding of circumstances that might change um, as opposed to putting that into hard writing it has to come before you all anyway right so you would have the opportunity to approve or deny without setting in stone a situation that might end up being detrimental thank you Thank you, Becky. Brian? Uh, just an observation that uh, the area of these two projects is in front of these two facilities. No one else is going to develop there. Um, and also my observation is this is pretty much the extent uh, of space for which these expansions could happen. Uh, any further expansion would start to impede on moorings and the channel, which uh, for me uh, have been, you know, the, the cutoff point. We have not uh, negatively impacted anything yet, any further expansion. I would uh, have to say uh, now we're, we're impacting other users of the harbor, and I don't see that with these projects. No one else is going to develop it there. All right, thank you, uh, Kathy Bellata. Hey, uh, just a quick clarification. It was my understanding, and maybe uh, Byron can. Yes. I'm sorry, can you hear me? Uh, that's yeah, that's right. better. Sorry. Um, it was my understanding, and maybe Byron can confirm, but part of the uh, reason for supporting these expansions was it would improve the safety of the navigation in in the harbor because of of, uh, of the way uh, the boats moved in the wind, et cetera. Brian can do a better job of explaining that, but I just want to um, I, I'd be concerned if we were delaying a potential safety improvement. Um, one to two years out. So I just, maybe I misunderstood, but maybe Bayon could could speak to that. Yeah. Right, I've, I've said all along the navigation. Up, I'm sorry. Up also, it's, it's hard for me to hear. Sure, so uh, from my perspective, navigation, if these projects move forward, uh, greatly improve navigation. Skip actually has been out in front of that with his work at my request to uh, help the uh, mooring holders convert to bound stern at my request in the cove and then to realign those moorings. Um, it's, it's safer now and if these projects move forward, it will be even safer. These projects are a benefit to the harbor from a safety standpoint. Christina, go ahead. I guess I just wanna be really clear. I'm not asking for this to be postponed. I do think it's a good project. My concern is that this is the second expansion without a harbor plan. So all I'm wanting is a commitment that this will not come in front of us. I kind of just don't want us any board until there's a harbor plan to approve any expansion. And I don't think a storm or anything like that is it. I'm just talking about a true expansion without a harbor plan. That's what I'm asking for to be put in a condition. And Greg, you tell me how to do it, but that is my concern that this is the second expansion. And I do think it's good. I think it's expanding jobs. It's, it's a doing that, but I am concerned that we're going forward with a lot of things on the harbor without a plan. So I'm not postponing anything for two years. I just don't want the opportunity to come in front of us that we have to condition something. I think we need to hit a pause. I'm saying, I think it, this is good to put a condition on it that there's no more expansion until the plan is done. I don't think that's too unreasonable. Thank you. The applicant has his hand up. Uh, Mr. Crocker. So this, so this one, what she's asking for is no future expansion beyond this current project in front of you tonight. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And can I finish? 
So and this would only apply to chapter 91 projects on the water. If I want to do something like building on, change my building on okay. land, I can move ahead with that. No issue. Yeah. Quite honestly, my project on the water <laughs> is sort of the maximum what I can do on the water. <clears throat> And it would take me two years to get permits in. So <laughs> at this point, going forward beyond this project, I'm okay with the conditions. So you're yeah. um sounds like you're okay with putting that um sure condition on. Can I make uh, can I make a suggestion for the condition? Yes. Um if we were to add a condition that this uh um that no further uh application for special permit that would extend this use. Um, shall be uh, considered by the planning board um, until such time as the harbor master plan has been completed or three years have passed. Because I, I feel like I want, I hate to burden um, a private, uh, you know, a taxpayer um, with that unless we kind of limit it to a certain. As long as, as, long as it doesn't apply to repairs and maintenance. No, I mean, so, this is extent, ex expansion, so. Well, uh, float expansion, yeah. maybe? Yeah, no, float expansion would be, uh, yeah, no float or or further, or even um, additional expansion for under special permit review, just sort of additional expansion. Laura? Well, we started off talking about the Crocker project. I don't know that we've talked about Marine, the Manchester Marine yet, but I, I do want to, and we're talking about all these conditions, and we did, Discuss with Bion, I apologize for jumping ahead, about the fixed floats on the other side. So we're, yeah. we're having these larger conversations about conditioning the development of the whole thing, it sounds like, while we haven't yet had the conversation about fixing the floats. <laughs> Say, I, I'm totally with Christina about the need for a harbor plan. I think it's really important. I'm very glad to hear from Ray who started it. I do think it's very important to Manchester to support our blue economy. I mean, our, our healthy working harbor is, is critical to who, the, to who we are as a town. Um, and I, I have to put a lot of my faith in Bayon and his expertise as our harbor master. He says that it's an improvement to safety and navigation and that there's not a negative impact on the harbor. And he too, I'm sure will have you know, um, play a play an important role as we get into the Harbor Master Plan. But if the, there's an improvement um, to the safety of all boaters, small and large, uh, private and commercial, then I, I at least, you know, I'm taking that as sort of the bigger, the biggest um, factor here is the um, is the testimony from Bayan. Okay, so the language Sarah suggested of no ex expansion for the next two. Years I said three. Three, three years. Harbor yeah. master plan or three years, whichever is sooner. Christina, would that be acceptable? That language? Yes. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, uh, Betsy, you have that language? Got it. Uh, any um, motion. motion for that? So uh, I move agree. that we uh, approve the special permit of Crocker's Boatyard 15 Ashland Avenue. It's a special permit application for the expansion of docks um, with the um, draft decision as, as with amendments discussed tonight. Um, we'll, will we approve this draft? Will the, um, I think we'll approve the draft, we'll draft tonight, Betsy, right? So I'm gonna write a draft. I'm gonna write all the um, conditions that you've added, and I'm going to give it to Ron to review. And if he views that it's sufficient, he will sign it, and the town clerk will get it stamped in. Okay, great. So that's my motion. There's a second. I don't understand why we don't see the draft and vote on the draft. When, and the final, final draft. draft. No, because you don't have a meeting for another month. And I think it was felt that um, they wanted to get going, but I'm certainly willing to do it that way too. But conversely, I had Gary at the first meeting I attended saying, why don't we vote it tonight? So 
I'm kind of confused about the process here. I mean, normally your planning board, one member makes writes the decision, the other one checks it, and then it's done. So that's what I'm proposing. I'm comfortable with that. Okay. I mean, we have a draft. Yeah. We have a draft. With, we've just added essentially parking and the time limited expansion. Okay. Comments from the harbor board. And you wanted language about the tugboat. Oh, and the tugboat. The tugboat, yeah. Yeah. Breaking up the ice. Okay. So okay. motion's been made and seconded. Uh, any further discussion? Um, roll call, uh, Sarah? Yes. Uh, Chris? Yes. Laura? Yes. Uh, Christina? Yes. Chair votes yes. Okay. Um, sorry, I made Addie come earlier. Uh, uh, so, uh, Betsy, do I need to close the public hearing now? Um, yes, you can close the public. Actually, we should close. Yeah, close the public hearing. Move to close the public hearing. I'll second. The motion made to move close the public hearing on Crocus Boatyard. I remain and seconded. Any discussion? Roll call. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Christina. Yes. And the chair votes yes. Closed. So now I'd like to open the continuation of the public hearing for Manchester Marine voting doc section 7.5 4.1.10. Again, it says the same thing. The Harbor Advisory Committee met on December 7th. Uh, being attended by myself, Sarah Creighton, and town planner Betsy Ware. I acknowledge the application uh, applicant in attendance. Does the applicant have any comments at this time? The, the applicant has agreed to have the condition about the bottom belt floating docks in the place. So far. Thank you. Can we just um, talk about what the light would be for Betsy so we're clear on? Maybe you can help us um, see what the words are. Can you? Maybe the first the 50 foot long ones. Yeah, I mean, you could. Uh, could you with, what was the question? By on discretion has said, you know, what's necessary for the safety and navigation as the project proceeds. So so they're responding. Know. Yeah, thank yeah, you. This is the, uh, my floating docks. Question about the floating docks, which Bion said the combination of the floating docks on the opposite hand of the channel, right? The expansion on the marine side. Yes. Those things together would make the channel safer so that none of the docks are swinging. One thing that we had talked about internally on the site that day was, um, you know, we have the three fifty foot long ones. Yeah. If we could have the float, the bottom held floating docks that are opposite those, yes. because that, we don't know if they're ready to do the whole thing right now. Mm -hmm. At least at a minimum, if we got those put in, that's definitely going to help. And that's where that would define the opposite hand of the channel. Yes. Yeah. So there's um, ten total ten ten floating docks. So there'd probably be like five, maybe. Um, so the first five, if you were to look at the plan, yeah. would both help with uh, the Crocker's Boatyard project and those longer fingers that we have proposed in terms of defining the channel for that area, keeping boats from swinging into it. This is the moorings, the yeah. current moorings, yes. Let me just show you. Oh, okay, thank you. So this is the 50 foot. Fingers here. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we're saying if we did like at a minimum, five. Did, yeah, yeah, at a minimum, if we do that, that will help define where Crocker's and what's yes, going to be. That would be those 50s, yeah. Crocker. This is Crocker. That's Crocker. Right. And that's okay. the terminal piece. Yeah. And these are the three 50 foot fingers. Okay. And that's where a lot of the concern was with the 50 foot line. Yeah. So if we get those five in, that will set. Uh -huh. You know, and then they won't feel like they have to do the whole thing if they're not ready right. to do it. Right. Let me ask Bayon if that makes so sense. So Bayon, yeah, they wanted to um, head the first five moorings heading west. Yes. Bayon, any issues or comments? I do not. Uh, I think that's fine. That's a fine start. Any, any other comments? Oh, um, yeah, the question is, are you not intending to do the other four um, floating docks? Well, they are, but you're going to be conditioning the special permit on those. So they weren't necessarily ready to go ahead with all of them right now, but they're willing to. Oh, so you're saying limit the, the floating dock uh, 
the conversion like from the mooring from the free, free whatever it's called free swinging mooring yeah. to floating docks to those four floating docks five, that are five, five yeah. that are uh, directly opposite crockers so. crockers in the and the 50 foot long yeah fingers. and then the others are I mean, I hope to, to help do them. I guess, yeah. I mean, I think it's the same issue for the others. They swing into the channel and you've got a real pinch point there as you approach the railroad. I mean. But, yeah, I mean, part of the, the second five moorings and, um, you know, Brian chime in on this was he had suggested that those second five might have a little delay anyway, as he kind as we kind of, sort out how that's all going to work with the rest of the harbor. Um, what if we said the condition would be that the, all the uh, Manchester Marines moorings would be converted to um, floating docks by the summer of 2024 or something that was time limited? Or acceptable to buy on. The, there might be, they may not be able to put in this last one or maybe the last two. Well, less, less worried about yeah. They're less worried about those than, than the ones right across from the facility, right? And across from the, ga the gas dock. I mean, that the gas docks, yeah, yeah. I know. It just. Are those you, boats. Okay, let's put in three of those second set of five. I mean, those boats I mean, swing into the channel. Them. It's like oh, a. I mean, eventually, it's yeah. just a matter of time. You know, a low tide on a wind, those boats on those mornings was swinging into the channel. And that the whole point argument here has been that the channel is going to be defined. Yeah. Let's see. Mm -hmm. And safer. So, collaborate with my arm. <laughs> yeah, obviously, in collaboration with with the harbor master, okay. that the how many is the total? There's ten total. Ten. The ten total more is to be converted to floating docks on a time frame and uh, acceptable. acceptable to the harbor master. Yep, that's good. Okay, in coordination, acceptable to the harbor master. Yeah, that makes sense. Because I think the argument here has been that that's the that's, that's a safety safer. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Is that working for Biom? Yes. Uh, so uh, it it does work for me. Uh, you know, ultimately, um, we're looking to get them all converted. I think we're all on the same page there. Okay. And so it's uh, ten moorings that get converted to floating docks under your purview. <coughs> No, I think it's 10. 10. 10. 10? Yeah. That's what I said. 10 floating docks will be installed. 10 floating docks will be installed. Yeah, 10 floating docks. Well, you're converting 10. Are you converting 10 moorings to, it is to 10 20 moorings boats? Total. Yeah, 10 moorings per okay. It's 20 boats, 10 no. floating docks. Is that correct? Don't say the boats. Just 10 floating docks. Floating docks. Floating docks. No, boats. no boats. Never mind. <laughs> so we have that condition, and then I believe we're passing on the other conditions we voted previous for Crockers. Well, just the park, not the lobster boat. Not, yeah, yeah, not just the, the park. Ice breaking, the harbor uh, land. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <guys. laughs> Sarah had another question. I have another question. Um, at the Harbor Advisory Committee meeting, um, you said that in your case that the um, dock expansion, the additional dock would be largely for operational docks, not for, um, not for, you know, uh, permanent slip, yeah, slips or. I'd say about half, half of our project is for, to increase our operational capabilities, not to rent more space to, to um, okay. So your financial analysis, did that reflect a, all the docks are occupied by um, it, Harbor, uh, whatever, you know, um, slip, uh, rental, slip rentals, or did it reflect that only half of them were? It reflected that half of them would okay. be operated. Great. Any other comments? Just want to make sure the applicant is under aware that the condition in the Manchester Marine permits. Maybe I should. We should read them to them. Uh, Manchester Marine Corporation will continue to operate a fueling dock and pump out station in accordance with acceptable state and federal laws. 
There will be no expansion of the channel of the proposed floating dock system. Continuing the necessary funding with design and fabrication of safety signs for paddle boards. Um, and then I think we're going to add the same condition as prior in terms of no expansion. Um, unless there's a harbor master plan or three years, whichever is more is sooner. And parking on site. Comment on the um, no expansion into the channel. Can can that just be re reworded a little bit to say that um, no vessels will intrude on the proposed seventy foot wide channel shown on the plans? I think that's your intent, right? Because it really isn't. I mean, that could be read and interpreted in different ways. So the recommendation um, is that we change number five. There will be no expansion into the channel of the proposed floating dock system. Of the two. proposed 70 foot wide channel shown on the plans. So to two, there will be no intrusion um, by docked vessels into the channel. Yeah, into the channel shown on the plans. Thank you. Yeah, I had that concern too. Betsy, you have that change. Um, do you want to repeat it again? So change number five to there shall be no um, intrusion. Vessel, there's, vessels shall not uh, be docked so as to impede the channel or something like that. 70 foot wide channel. 75 foot wide travel channel. Yeah, thank you. Travel channel. Yes, that's, not, that's not what my intent was. My intent is that what's being proposed is what's going to be built and nothing else is going to be expanded. Right. I think we're going to add the same. Christina, this is a separate. Um, okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We are going to add, I think um, we proposed adding the same condition as we did to Crocker's regarding the Harbor Master Plan and a three year uh, expiration of that condition. And that, that condition that you just mentioned that we were just talking about before, that's on Crocker's too. So maybe the same language could be revised. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Betsy, same language on both applications on the condition that Sarah just said. No, no vessel shall impede into the 70 foot wide channel. Pardon? Well, that would be about that on the Crockers. Right. I think that's not the Crockers. We can add that. Right on Crockers. Are we suggesting to add it into both? If it's not on Crockers, then. Uh, I think we just about did that already. We're just talking about managed scoring right now. Okay. All right. So, um, any other conditions? Any other comments? Ready to vote this application? So, what I would advise is to close the public hearing first and then make a motion to move forward on the decision. I move we close the public hearing. Second. Motion to uh, close, been made and seconded. Any comment, uh, discussion? Roll call, uh, chair votes yes. Yeah. Sarah? Yes. Yes. Christina? Yes. Close the public hearing. Uh, I'd like to take a motion to vote the decision as amended tonight. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? Roll call. Uh, chair votes yes. Christina? Yes. Uh, Laura? Yes. Chris? Yes. Sarah? Yes. Thank you. Have a nice holiday. Thank you. Okay. Okay. At this time, um, we have a preliminary uh, traffic study report um, by MAPC and Addie Noshur. Um, I've given you control of the um, co-host, so you can put your slides up. This is a initial um, results of a study that they performed, and I believe um, We'll, uh, you know, review the uh, presentation, answer questions, and I believe you guys will be back in February to continue. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm trying to share my slides right now, but I don't think I've been made a co-host yet. Hold on. Okay, okay, let me try that again. 
Yeah, can folks see that okay? Yeah, yeah. sorry, I forgot. All right, well, um, thank you to the, the planning board for having me. Uh, I was I appreciate the opportunity to uh, kick off this project with a presentation to you all in March. Um, so I imagine many of you were there then and I'm excited to be back. Uh, my name is Adi Nochur. I'm a senior transportation planner with the Metropolitan Area Planning Council or MAPC. We are the regional planning agency for Greater Boston, 101 cities and towns from the North Shore down to the South Shore and out to Metro West. Um, we've worked with uh, the town of Manchester by the sea on a number of projects over the years, including some economic development work, I think four or five years ago, that was before I was with the agency, but I know um, parking has been a hot button topic throughout a number of those conversations and actually I believe in that economic development work, one of the recommendations was to do um, a downtown parking study so appreciate the opportunity to come back and build off of that work and to uh, share about the downtown parking study with you. We've been working hard on this um, over the past year. And like I said, I presented on this back in March and we've made some significant progress since then. So I'm uh, eager to share with you a little bit about what we've done and where we're headed. So just to quickly um, recap, the goals of the parking study were on a basic level to provide um, information about the existing uh, parking usage in downtown Manchester by the sea. What's the existing uh, parking capacity? What's the occupancy? What's the duration? You know, how much of the parking is being utilized and how long are people parking for? So we want to give you all some good um, data to work with. And then um, based on that data, we wanna provide policy and land use recommendations that can enable you all to manage your existing parking supply more effectively. And uh, towards the end of this presentation, I'll get into some preliminary recommendations that we're thinking about based upon our data and analysis so far. And then the last goal that we've laid out in the scope of work was to inform how you might think about new zoning in light of the new MBTA multifamily uh, zoning requirement. So if there is potentially gonna be new uh, residential development or multifamily development in and around the downtown, how might that um, impact the parking situation in and around the downtown? Uh, can the existing uh, parking capacity uh, absorb that or might additional measures be, be necessary? And how does that again impact policy and land use within town? So these are some of the uh, parking study goals that I laid out back in March and just wanted to recap for all of you quickly here. Um, so this is just a look at our downtown study area. If you can follow my cursor here, we surveyed um, a number of on-street parking locations along Route 127, and then going down uh, Beach Street uh, to, um, towards Singing Beach and um, up Summer Street as well. So those were the on-street uh, public parking locations that we surveyed, about 125 on-street parking spaces, uh, most of those being two-hour parking spaces. We also looked at a number of off-street parking lots um, at Town Hall, Masconomo Park, uh, Harbors Point 40 Beach Street Condo Association, where you also have the MBTA commuter parking, and uh, Norwood, at, Norwood Ave and North Street. So you can see those um, off-street parking lots um, outlined in gray. So that was um, the focus of our parking study effort. And then just a little bit more about that, um, I mentioned 125 on-street parking spaces, and this is the breakdown of um, the off-street um, uh, parking spaces, Town Hall, Norwood Ave, and Masconomo Park, uh, mostly public parking, Harbors Point 40 Beach Street, mostly um, private parking, uh, with for a total of um, 484 parking spaces across all of those locations. And then we also got some additional data on the Singing Beach parking lot, which has about 124 spaces. And that data was provided to us by town recreation staff and um, Cheryl Marshall and her team uh, provide us with some seasonal data there. But um, myself and Sue Brown and a number of volunteers surveyed um, the other uh, locations I mentioned. So a little bit uh, more about the process. There was a um, strong interest in doing data collection on both um, a spring weekday, as well as a summer weekend to really understand how the parking uh, at Singing Beach impacts the parking downtown. So we did data collection from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. on Tuesday, May 25th, and 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. on Saturday, July 16th, slightly extended data collection to account for some of the summer uh, usage patterns. We had a very robust group of um, study volunteers. Um, some of you might be joining this meeting tonight. 
who walked predetermined routes every hour on the hour to collect the occupancy data. So literally to determine how many parking spaces were being occupied each hour on the hour using um, pretty intensive data sheets, which I'll show you an example of on the next slide. We also collected um, partial license plate data for the vehicles that were parked on street because we want to get a sense of how long are these vehicles actually parking for. So in addition to the capacity, we want to get a sense of the duration as well. Uh, we unfortunately weren't able to capture duration data for the off street parking lots. We just counted the numbers of cars that were parked in different areas of those parking lots. Actually um, doing the license plate data for the off street parking lots, unfortunately that was beyond um, the, the scope of what we we're able to do for this data collection. But um, we did get robust um, duration data for the on street parking. And then um, town recreation staff provided us with um, parking data for the Singing Beach parking lot on Sunday the 17th. Um, of July, which was a day after we had gone and done the on street and parking lot data collection, but we were assured by um, Cheryl and her team that the Sunday data was comparable um, to what uh, the data would have been for that Saturday. So um, that gives us a rough analog to look at and look at um, kind of the total parking picture there. So this is just a quick sample of what a data collection sheet looked like for the on street spaces. We have had every individual spot uh, delineated and we wrote down um, the partial license plate info um, to get a sense of whether those spots were occupied. We left it blank or with a dashed line if it wasn't occupied. If it was occupied by the same car um, hour after hour, we put arrows um, to indicate that. So this is just a brief snapshot into how we uh, gathered the data for the on-street parking occupancy and duration. And so starting to get into some of our results, we made um, occupancy maps for both um, of the data collection days we did for each hour. So this is a sample map that shows the peak parking occupancy for Tuesday, May 25th. And you can see that overall parking occupancy for the entire study area we looked at was 50%, but you can see how the um, occupancy varies by location as well. Uh, you know, the higher occupancy in red and sort of mid-tier occupancy in the orange and yellow and lower occupancy in green. And we have uh, maps like this for every hour uh, for, May, for May 25th, but this was just an, wanted to share this as an illustrative example from a peak, the peak parking um, occupancy for the entire day. And similarly for July 16th, uh, we found a peak occupancy of 71%. Again, that was at 1 p.m. And you can see you know, higher utilization at this, um, at this time and on this date, um, largely folks um, parking for to go to Singing Beach uh, by and large. So you can see that um, a beach weekend does um, significantly increase the parking occupancy pattern in downtown Manchester by the sea. And then this chart um, is going back to May 25th, showing the hourly occupancy variations across the entire day, starting at 8 a.m. and continuing till 8 p.m. when we gathered data. So you can see um, about 30% occupancy to start at 8 p.m., gradually rising to that peak of just of 50% at 1 p.m., and then you get a gradual decrease um, again throughout the day. So these are hour over hour variations. Similarly for July 16th, again at around 8 a.m. starting at 30%, rising throughout the morning and early afternoon to that peak of 71% uh, around 1 p.m. And then you see the decline throughout the day back to about 50% by 5 p.m. and back down to 30% uh, by 9 p.m. Or, or 10 p.m. So you see um, higher occupancy um, during uh, the beach weekend, tapping out at about, maxing out at about uh, 70%, 71%. A couple more maps for you here. So this is um, average hourly occupancy for May 25th. Um, so this is taking all 12 hours and just taking the average. So you see um, we got an average occupancy of 39% for the entire day on May 25th. And again, you can see there are some uh, slight fluctuations in terms of which areas have higher or lower occupancy. Similarly, for July 16th, uh, we have a peak, um, an average hourly occupancy of 53%. Again, no surprise that that's a little bit higher than 39%, given the higher usage for Singing Beach and, and other weekend activities, potentially. And again, some uh, local localized variations as well. But um, so slightly higher occupancy, but still um, a lot of uh, capacity for additional parking. 
Getting into some of the uh, duration data here, uh, you can see the average duration data for the on-street parking for May 25th here. Um, most of the on-street parking is two-hour parking, and by and large, people are adhering to those um, posted parking limits, except for this little area up on, I believe that's I believe that's Union Street, Route 127, where you have people parking for a bit longer than the, the posted limit. And I think over here on this segment of Route 127 as well, right outside that uh, multifamily building there. Um, and we did we did observe people who were parking for um, longer than uh, two hours. So, you know, some there were a handful of folks who were parking for four or five hours or even longer. So we do have some of those individual data points. Uh, presumably um, some of those folks might be um, employees at some of the small businesses who might be parking longer term. We also did observe a handful of instances where people might have parked in one spot for a couple of hours and then they just moved up the block for another couple hours. So uh, probably to avoid the two hour time limit. So again, these might be uh, folks who work in some of the small businesses are just moving their car um, to avoid um, getting a parking ticket perhaps. Again, here's the average duration for July 16th. Even with the increased um, utilization I mentioned earlier for Singing Beach, you still see that folks are um, adhering to those posted time limits for the most part, again, with um, that area of Union Street kind of being an outlier there. But I think speaks to um, the power of the seasonal enforcement that's happening that people know to expect tickets or violations if they do park beyond those posted parking limits. So by and large, again, you're seeing here that even on a busy summer beach day uh, on a weekend, that folks are adhering to those posted um, those posted time restrictions. So this um, helps us pivot to some of our key findings. I really want to point to this top takeaway over here that um, parking occupancy is consistently below an 85% benchmark, which is commonly used for occupancy when it comes to downtown parking studies and analysis. 85% um, really is sort of the sweet spot where um, most spaces are occupied, but there's always a few spaces that are available for um, folks to find on-street parking if they need it. So the fact that occupancy for the study area is consistently below 85% actually indicates that you do have an adequate parking supply in downtown Manchester by the sea. So I would say that is probably the biggest takeaway from uh, this preliminary analysis here. With that said, um, there are some location specific variations in the parking occupancy, and that creates potential for more targeted or localized parking management strategies as well. And I'll share a little bit more about that momentarily. Again, as I mentioned, while most people are adhering to the posted time limits, you do have some people parking on street for extended durations, which might um, speak to how some of the employee parking programs might be used or not being used. Again, I'll say a little bit more about that shortly. And another uh, key takeaway is that the off-street parking lots contain a broad and sometimes complicated and confusing variety of parking regulations. So that's another piece to keep in mind as we think about uh, improving parking management in downtown Manchester by the sea. So some of the preliminary recommendations that this helps point us towards, um, some of the suggestions would be to add pavement markings uh, for to more clearly delineate some of the parking spaces along Route 127. Um, as it stands on Beach Street and other parts of the downtown, they're very well marked um, parking spaces. So if the same could be done on Route 127, it could make a pretty big difference in terms of folks knowing precisely where to park and really clarifying the number of parking spaces that, that are available. Similarly, on the eastern end of Summer Street, where um, the road kind of goes uphill and takes a curve to the left. That's another area that could benefit from increased delineation of parking spaces and perhaps some improved signage as well. This was an area where you have um, a posted two hour parking restriction, but most people um, by and large don't really park there. Um, in our data and our analysis, we found that this was an area where parking was on street parking was consistently underutilized, perhaps because it might be a little bit farther away from some of the small businesses. There might not be as much activity in the immediate vicinity, but it's still very much legitimate public parking that people could utilize on street. So increasing the visibility of some of those parking spaces on the farther reach of Summer Street in particular is another uh, preliminary recommendation at this point um, in our analysis. Um, we'd also want to think of opportunities to enhance assess um, and enhance uh, signage on street for the parking throughout the downtown. 
Um, as I mentioned, Union Street, where people are parking for longer than two hours on average, maybe there could be opportunities to increase enforcement, whether it's on a seasonal basis or potentially longer term as well. We also know that the connections between some of the on street or the off street parking lots um, and the broader town downtown might be lacking at, at times. So to increase utilization of these lots, can you enhance uh, wayfinding? Can you enhance pedestrian connections? And I know there's strong interest in this in particular uh, when we talk about how do folks move between the town hall, hall, hall parking lot and Beach Street as well. So thinking about how we improve those connections, make them more visible, make them more attractive so people can get back and forth between different parking areas and the broader downtown is gonna be really important. A few more recommendations, as um, I mentioned, uh, the, the off street parking lots have a pretty broad and, um, and oftentimes complicated uh, set of parking regulations. So think of thinking about opportunities to simplify or adjust those regulations to um, meet uh, what the actual needs are and to enhance or alter the signage if necessary. I think that's something that we've we heard throughout the study that the signage is, is lacking in some of these off street parking lots. So how can you make it very clear um, who's supposed to park where and, and when? So as part of that, we would want to certainly think of opportunities to assess the utilization of the existing business parking program with the placards. Um, could there be opportunities to allocate or lease additional spaces in the off street parking lots for some of that longer term employee parking so that can free up some of the on street spaces for folks who are visiting the downtown and might have other needs sure. there. So, um, so that's one piece uh, that could be reassessed and looked at. And then as um, there might be opportunities for more residential development, could there be a specific parking program for downtown residents who might inhabit new multifamily developments in and around the downtown? And can um, spaces again be allocated or leased in some of those off street parking lots? And then one final element as, as part of that, if there is gonna be increased utilization of parking downtown, if there are gonna be more residents living or working in the downtown, can there be opportunities for shared parking agreements with some of these local institutions or businesses that have large amounts of parking, but they might not be utilizing it throughout the day, say um, at the American Legion or the First Paris Church, um, Santander Bank, some of these different uh, locations in and around um, the downtown where um, maybe some of these spaces could be put to longer term use. So um, some of the next steps, um, we're going to develop a final parking study report um, in, the, in the early new year. So that will go much more in depth on all the data and recommendations I just shared. Um, and the, that final report will also include an addendum that gets into more detail about what these potential parking impacts could be of the increased residential development downtown. So we'll be modeling a few scenarios that go into some more detail. And um, I'm excited to have the opportunity to field some questions and comments from you all tonight, but there's my email contact if you want to reach me beyond tonight. And I'll look forward to coming back to this board again in February when we have um, the final report for to share with all of you. So again, I'm, I, I want to appreciate um, and thank you again for your time and I'll um, take some questions. So I'll just um, stop the screen share for now, but I can bring it back up if folks want to reference any of those slides again. And I believe you, you have it for reference in your packets as well. Okay, thank you, Addy. Um, any questions or comments from the board? Christina? Yeah, I have quite a few, actually. Um, thanks, Adi. Um, I think I've asked once Sue left um, for the data. I've done a few interviews. I don't see any of the interviews mentioned in this. I thought we were supposed to be delineating like what businesses were using some of these spots, where they should and shouldn't be parking. So I guess, where's that information? Um, the day in July was less than optimal. I think we were aiming for a really sunny day in July and that day wasn't. So is there any kind of modeling that you can do that predict if more people would have come to the beach that day? Because my recollection, it was pretty drizzly in the morning, may have cleared up in the afternoon, but that was not the, you know, 85, 90 degree perfect beach day that I think we were looking to do this data collection. Um, I guess high level, I, I don't know where some confusion might be, but the planning board is the board that should be doing studies and is responsible for studies. And like one of the responsibilities was to come to the boards and talk to the boards about where you thought we thought parking issues were, but we weren't contacted, right? I don't know what boards you went to, but we weren't asked where we thought as the planning board, where the concerns were. Um, I think early on we laid out, you know, how many cars, 
like some of this basic data collection, like how many cars are registered in Manchester. So um, some of these concerns, I just not sure if they've been addressed here. And my um, final one was it, you are communicating with another group of residents, citizens, volunteers, which isn't the planning board, like in advance of the planning board. I guess I just want to reiterate, we are the board that's in charge of study. So I'm um, concerned that this information isn't getting passed through to the planning board. I mean, this was notified on several days. It took several questions to get this information. I still don't have some of the data. Um, and uh, like, I would like you to also address a, a, another study that or survey that the downtown improvement is doing and how that is correlating with this. So there's a lot of there, I'm sorry. Sure, um, I'll, I'll try and address as much of that as I can. And I might defer to um, the chair or, or Betsy, or um, I, I see Cheryl is here on some of those other points that you raise. As to your, your first point about um, the data, I can take a, a look back and see what we are able to share. I'm not sure to what extent we've shared raw data from past parking studies we've done in, in other municipalities. But if that would be of interest, I can figure out, I can potentially figure out a way for us to do that. Um, I'm, I'm trying to remember all the different points you brought up. With respect to um, communicating with the, the planning board, you know, I was primarily working with Sue Brown on this earlier, as, fo as folks might know, and I know there's been a lot of uh, transition recently, so, you know, I, uh, so that's been a little challenging to navigate, so I, I'm you know, just trying to pick that up here as, as best as I can now. Um, as far as the beach uh, parking day goes, um, you know, we did the study area data collection on a Saturday. Um, and I, I'm trying to remember what the weather was like that day. Maybe that was the day that was a little drizzly. The parking data that was provided to us um, by Cheryl was for the following Sunday, uh, the day after. And I think that might have been a hotter or more sunnier day. But Cheryl did um, communicate to me that that data was um, you know, reflective of what uh, you know, a well-utilized no, summer no, no, beach no. day would be. The second day, we were thinking a spring day and comparing it to a summer sunny day. Like, th but the day that we collected, the second was not a sunny day. Like, that's my point. So is there some kind of modeling that you can do like X percentage better if the weather, because that was definitely not an optimal day, weekend day for a draw in Manchester. It was drizzly, right? That's my question. How can your data that you collected that day be modeled to a sunny day? Because that wasn't, and that's what we were under the expectation of. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if that's something we can do. To be honest, uh, most municipal parking studies we do, we we typically do one day of data collection. We did two days of data collection in this instance because we heard um, from folks that we wanted uh, to also get an understanding of the beach traffic on a, on a summer weekend, and so um, you know we, we we did that to the best that we could. Um, you know, some I know these things. The weather is is unpredictable, but it was a pretty involved effort. Um, so I don't know that we could you know project modeling wise for the weather uh, because that's you know something we've never done before in terms of you know doing parking data collection on a weekend because folks are are going to the beach. So this is a little bit of a special case for us, and I you know I think we tried to do the best we could um, given the circumstances. Any comments from the board, Laura? Uh, I have a couple of questions. Thanks, Adi, for the presentation. I was one of the planning board members asked to um, uh, be a volunteer. So I volunteered on that July 16th, Saturday, from I think one in the afternoon till 9 p.m. that night through that eight o'clock hour. Um, it did not rain. It was not, it was not, um, the hottest, sunniest day of the afternoon during the time I was there, it didn't rain. It was a little cooler than a sort of, you know, spectacular beach day. And then I don't remember what the weather was on Sunday when Cheryl provided the um, information for the traffic uh, at the beach. I wanted to ask Adi a um, couple of questions. One is, I remember that we were surveying um, handicapped ADA accessible spaces. And I wondered if you had any conclusion about um, those in terms of their um, uh, location and uh, use and um, um, whether the, uh, you know, kind of as a percentage of um, spaces, it's um, 
typical to what you might see. And then also you made a comment that a lot of the highly utilized spaces were, um, it was assumed that those were for people going to the beach. I've often wondered about that because the spaces on Beach Street, and they used to go farther towards the beach until the town uh, pulled it back a few years ago, but they're all two hour spaces. And um, it's not a real long time by the time you walk down to the beach and from wherever you're parked, and then you gotta get back in time to move your car before two hours. So I'm wondering if you had a kind of a location limit half mile or if you had some kind of radius by what you decided might be beach parking versus uh, just some other visitor to the town, given that we, we didn't really know, you know what people were parked there for. Is there, is there a radius that you're considering there? Those yeah, that, that, that's a good question. To your first question about the, um, the ADA spaces, I haven't um, drawn any conclusions or taken a close look at the data for those just yet, but certainly can do that as part of the final um, parking study report and definitely want to think about the location of handicapped spaces. Are there sufficient handicapped spaces? So if that's um, of interest, we can definitely uh, share, share a bit more about that in the report. Um, and to your point about the uh, the beach parking, that, that is an interesting point that, you know, if people are sort of sticking to this two hour parking limit, are they really walking to the beach and then coming back in a pretty constrained window? So, you know, it's impossible to say for for sure that folks are, are using the, you know, parking on Beach Street and then walking to the beach and coming back within two hours. It seemed to be a, a reasonable assumption, but maybe there are some things that we need to check about that. But I think we can say with um, confidence that there are more people, you know, parking in and around the downtown on a summer weekend as opposed to a spring week, I weekday. Wonder yeah, I wonder just as a point of clarification, when the report comes out, if it's useful to draw, you know, half mile radius from Singing Beach to which parking spaces fall within there, because some of the spaces you were showing on, say, Summer Street or, you know, more central to town, but farther to the beach, it's hard for me to imagine that some of those spaces that are farther from the beach are really going to be practical for people trying to walk down the beach, get back in two hours. Um, mm -hmm. So it just might be interesting to do some kind of radius to see what kinds of destinations we think might people might be headed for. Yeah, uh, we, we can figure out a way to frame that in, in the report and, you know, sort of you know, surveying people and where they were going. We might just need to um, make some educated guesses here or, or you know, point that you know, maybe some further analysis would be needed. Uh, but that reminds me of, you know, one of uh, Christina's earlier question about the, the downtown survey that was done. You know, I've, I'm aware of that effort, that presentation. Has, has been shared with me from the, the interviews and surveys that were done. And so you know, I didn't speak to that today because I want to focus on the MAPC um, data collection effort, which, which some of you were involved with. But um, when it comes to the final report, you know, I definitely plan to reference that body of work as well. And so you know, how exactly I'll do that um, is still to be determined, but I, I will certainly reference the Downtown Improvement Committee and the work that's been done. Sarah, Chris. So, yeah, I have a couple of uh, things, Heidi. Um, it, it seems like there's a funny disconnect between people's perception of parking versus the data, the actual data. And I guess that's understandable because you remember when you can't find a parking space and that sticks in your mind, whereas the days that you can, there's just another day and you let it go by. So the uh, I think those summer weekend days are what people have in mind when they talk about uh, shortages of parking. But I still think it's interesting that um, in general, 85% is uh, acceptable for a downtown or maybe optimal. And the, the biggest uh, percentage of parking actually occupied is 70%. Uh, even if it were a drizzly day in the summer, that still is kind of surprising to me. But, um, you know, it's something we should keep in mind. The other thing is that I know there is a, there is a problem with people who live in apartments in the downtown without parking off-site, I mean, I'm sorry, without parking uh, on-site. And they're using whatever spaces they can find to park. And, I think that is something that's uh, a definite concern. Uh, I see Steve Carhart's um, probably going to speak on this also of the Downtown uh, Improvement uh, Program Group. 
And so maybe I should let him uh, talk about that a little bit. Uh, but I'm wondering, I guess going back to the perception, I'm wondering if there are things that you could recommend in the report that might help change people's perception somehow. Sure, and, I, um, and to your point about the, the perception versus the, the data, you know, I think you know, Manchester um, certainly isn't unique in, in this regard. And, you know, lots of cities and towns that MAPC has worked with over the years, you know, we constantly hear from folks that they think there's a parking shortage, and then we go out and gather the data, and it turns out that they're below that 85% that threshold. Um, and I think it's oftentimes the difference between, you know, parking right outside the establishment you might want to patronize or work that you might work at versus maybe a block or two away. And I would note that even in, you know, the downtown um, improvement committee survey that was done, I believe the businesses defined parking um, nearby as parking literally right outside their business. So I think that's part of the perception gap that we have to navigate that people are oftentimes used to finding parking that's nearby and, and convenient, you know, right outside their, their final destination, whereas, you know, parking spaces might be available if they circle the block or, you know, maybe park a, a block or way. So that's um, certainly speaks to the perception issue. Um, with respect to how we kind of communicate that at a higher level and what sort of recommendations we might make, you know, certainly um, improving signage in and around the downtown to the different parking areas could help with that. You know, we can consider whether some sort of map or you know a physical printed resource or online map could be made available and distributed and that the businesses have that available as well so that helps educate people a bit more about what their parking options are so certainly happy to um you know, add that to the list of recommendations if it would be of interest and then um to your point about uh downtown residents folks living in existing multifamily housing who don't have places to park or they might use um, some of the town hall lots or on street, you know, that speaks to one of the potential recommendations of, you know, maybe some sort of parking permit parking program specifically for downtown residents or those folks who are living downtown could be created and spaces could be set aside in some of the off street parking lots, whether at town hall or elsewhere. So, you know, definitely interested in visiting and visiting that in more detail. Well, I wonder how shopping malls get away with having people walk, you know, three or four times as far as they do in downtown Manchester. And no one complains at all when you're shopping. It's good shopping. It's <laughs> worth it. Well, maybe they do. Maybe they do. <laughs> Steve, I see you have a hand up. Let me just get through the board comments first. Um, Sarah, anything? Um, I thought your your findings were actually not surprising, which I think is good. Um, I did look, and July 16th was 68 to 81, and partly sunny. So. Um, my thought as we think about the synthesizing the results is, okay, so maybe if we bumped the July 16th data up by a, a weather factor of X percent, and even if you got to 100% on those mid midday hours, how does that change the recommendation? You don't have to answer that right now, but just think a little bit about you know, a few days a year, if we are at above the 85%, how does that change your recommendations? And then what are the recommendations for the various audiences? Because I do think, and maybe it's a, maybe you'll have to do that in the abstract, not knowing who was parking in those spaces, but still we know that there's residents who don't have a dedicated space. There's merchant, there's employees who are there for many hours. And then I think, um, one of the perceived problems about no parking is that the type of shopping establishments we have are, oh, I'll go in there if there's a space right in front of it. Mm -hmm. They tend to be the kind of place where you drop in maybe frequently to see what it, they have or get a quick birthday card or that kind of thing, rather than a place where you spend a lot of time, the restaurants aside, um, and maybe restaurants is a different audience. And maybe you don't know what who was parking there, but I think that the kinds of um, need, uh, and I put that in quote, uh, or perceived need um, might drive different recommendations. And then lastly, um, I think that your recommendations make sense. Um, at least in terms of striping and that kind of thing. And those probably belong with the DPW and the police or the select board or something like that. But I thought, interesting. 
Thank you. And I think um, to your point about the the different audiences and you know what are the different uses of of parking, you know certainly the the, the res residents, um, certainly the businesses and and the employees, and that's where I had a couple of those recommendations to think about what some of those um, permit parking programs might look like. You know, we talked about folks who might be visiting the beach, but there's sort of that reasonable question about what are they actually using the on-street parking or not versus are these folks more generalized visitors to the downtown. So I think you know, we can certainly talk about um, in the final report you know, who those users are and make some educated assumptions about you know, how they're using some of those parking spaces and what sort of recommendations would um, suit their needs and interests. Thank you. Um, just my comment. Um, we may be changing the density in the downtown in the future next, uh, on this MBTA community uh, edict. I'm wondering if there's any way to model um, what that might do potentially to uh, parking, depending on what gets, um, what kind of density changes we remake. Yes, absolutely. So that's that was part of the the scope of work for this project, and um, and I mentioned in the presentation that part of what we want to do with this um, study, which we actually which we haven't done in with past municipal parking studies, but we're doing it here because we heard from you all that this was important to you, was thinking about what would the impacts on the parking supply be if there were to be increased multifamily development downtown. So we will be modeling some scenarios that speak to that, um, and so that will be included in the the final report that we'll share um, early in the new year. And could you also, is it possible to get data from Cheryl on, you know, how many times uh, the, the uh, beach parking lot has filled up and how, how long it was filled up for um, I don't know, over the past year or two? Is that data available, do you know, or? Um, we do Cheryl? keep track of that. We do keep track of when the parking lot fills. Um, and in this study both the Saturday and Sunday the weather was about the same it was a great day it was above average um, as for people visiting the beach um, so I thought actually that was a great day to use as opposed to the five or six days that the parking lot fills and then people perceive that as every day when it's actually only about a half a dozen times a summer when the lot is full and when it's full, Cheryl, is it, you know, for hours? And, uh, you know? Not, not usually. Um, usually once it fills, it's, uh, you know, uh, late morning. And then it usually starts to turn over almost immediately after that. There's a lot of in and out. Okay. Just wondering if we could maybe get that into the report somehow. But you, of um, just of how many days it did fill? Is that the information? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Easy. Sure is. Yeah, I'll talk to Addy about that. And and to the to your point, Mr. Chair, about um wanting you know thinking about increasing density um, in in and around the downtown, if there are you know specifics proposals that you all might be thinking about that you're willing to share or, or ideas, I would encourage you to to share those with me so I can pass those along to our data services team so they can think about how that impacts yeah, the model. I think it would be um, immediate. I think it's we're a little we're a little further down the line with that, but certainly will. We have something. Okay, uh, let's talk to Steve Carhart on the downtown improvement. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, for those of you who may not be aware of our group, we are a town committee appointed by the select board. Uh, we, can, uh, we consist of seven volunteers and uh, we see our principal role as being trying to provide as much connective tissue as possible between the merchants, restaurants, institutions, and residents of our downtown and our hardworking elected and employed municipal uh, uh, leadership. Um, in connection with this effort, uh, we were engaged very closely with Adi and with uh, Sue Brown. And our particular contribution was to conduct a survey of residents, institutions, and, and merchants in downtown as to their views on parking. Uh, we also did some car counting and other uh, odd uh, volunteer works to try to help this overall project. Um, I would like to call, I am, I'm joined by my colleagues, uh, Marlene Dolan and Linda Crosby, who worked very hard on 
uh, the survey of citizen uh, opinion on parking. And uh, I'd like to turn it over to Marlene, uh, who designed the survey uh, for her uh, report, if that's okay, Mr. Chairman. Um, sure, Marlene, um, be brief. Thank you, um, I'll be brief. We sent a survey to 118 uh, downtown residents, businesses, uh, including the library, the, um, the church, the town hall, and restaurants. And we received a 31% response rate. And what I wanted to say is that we have um, facts and data from both all of those residents in addition to additional um, work that Sue Brown and I believe Christina has done with interviews directly. Our goal was to find out what directly our our downtown businesses needed and need and want for parking so that they can have a vibrant business. In that regard, I will say that although we have um, an overall parking supply that looks adequate, most of our uh, most of our businesses are asking for parking that is closely located to their front door. And we have uh, a problem in our back town hall lot with people that live downtown and need to find parking for their houses where they have no parking. So there's, there's although, so what I'm trying to say is, although there is a large parking availability in downtown, we are in a, we have a cacophony of problems with parking for the people that reside in downtown, which is problematic for both our merchants and our downtown residents. Finally, my last point will be for those that are coming to visit our town and would like to have a parking spot to enjoy restaurants, shopping, and going to the beach, they do not really have a lot of options because most of our residents are using the town hall lot. 80% of them are using that lot for their own parking. And um, the two hour slots on the streets are usually taken mostly by people that are working in the businesses that are on the street. So um, I think there's finer detail in this parking study that needs to be pulled out so that we can really understand the finite details of what's going on in our town with parking. Yeah, I think that that's absolutely right, Marlene, and nice nice to see you here. I think, um, you know, that's exactly what we'll get into in the for the purposes of the final report, which will go much more in depth, I think, for the purposes of the conversation today. Um, I want to keep it pretty high level and somewhat general and give you a sense of the direction we could go with this, but I agree that, you know, a lot more specificity is, is needed for this to be useful to all of you. And so that's what will be forthcoming in the next couple of months. So appreciate you raising those points and stay tuned for more. Great. And Nadi, I just wanted to ask one quick question. Why did you eliminate the um, Beach Street uh, span between, um, you know, the Calas and the Maris and so forth? Why was that off from your study? You didn't locate that in your study. Is this, um, I'm trying to think which segment that is offhand. Is that after you get past Masconomo Park going towards? No, that's before. Beach? It's when you take a hard right to go down Beach Street. That's like, that is like the main concern part of parking for all of the residents that responded to our survey. I was just wondering about that. It's like when you come down 127 before you get up Union Street, which by the way, to all those on the phone, Union Street is a big problem for the residents. Oh, we, we did look at Beach Street in its in its entirety for that segment. So um, maybe what you might be seeing um, where, where there, it might look like there are gaps are areas where parking might have been restricted, but we did survey all of the on street parking spaces on Beach Street. Okay, thank you. I just I just want to acknowledge uh, Linda Crosby, who is as uh, was also worked very hard on the on the survey uh, with Marlene, who's here tonight. Um, thank so. Thank you very much. If, if anything further comes up, we're glad to answer any questions that might be, we might be able to contribute to. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Kathy Bellata. 
Hi, just a um, quick point of information. I think the information in this parking study is really helpful and it's going to be even, uh, you know, I'm sure the final report is gonna be even more helpful. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, but when we, when the, it comes time for the final report to be published, I guess that's February. Um, I'm not sure if Greg is still on the call, but I would like Greg and Betsy to um, review the content of the report and determine which sections should be presented at a select board meeting. Some of what we've talked about tonight, you know, regulations on how different parking lots are used. Um, I think some of that is the purview of the select board and we would be the ones making decisions on any potential changes or recommendations. So I just wanna make sure, this is part of the governance work that we're doing um, uh, uh, to improve the communication amongst the boards. And so I just think it's helpful before the final report is discussed at a meeting, you know, Betsy and Greg kind of work together to carve out clarity around which of the recommendations that may be in that report would be planning board uh, purview versus select board versus somebody else. So just, just a thought to um, get, a, get all those roles and responsibilities discussed ahead of time. I think that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Christina? Thank you. Actually, I think I'm first I'm gonna follow up to Kathy. Um, you know, uh, the planning boards has two roles and one of those roles is to conduct studies and plans other resources and needs of the town. So as much as I appreciate uh, Marlene and Linda and Steve doing that, I do think there is a disconnect and hopefully the Board of Selectmen with this government is working, you know, help reconnect people and boards when they um, embark on this because I really do feel like the planning board and the downtown improvement should have been more partners on this. I don't feel like there was a lot of collaboration and it is the planning board's job to do studies. So um, if you guys can forward that information, your data and the questions, I would love to see that. And I think the rest of the board would like to see it. Um, I'm not sure if this was a one-off on this study. I'm really just still confused on how this downtown improvement started this, not here or there, but I do think we need more communication because ultimately it's my opinion that this was a planning board responsibility to do studies and jobs, which if we were working collaboration with the downtown improvement, you guys could have been the arm of it. But I feel like the town, some of the boards are kind of off on their own without direction. And maybe that needs to come from the board of selectmen. Um, but my final question is Adi, you know, talking about where this parking can be with the MBTA transit. So the MBAT transit is a half a mile, right? So there's this language that we can say in Manchester, we have the village, but now we're just talking about downtown parking. But when we talk about the village is where we're going to be talking about this MBTA over um, overlay district. So how are now we're going to take what you have done and extrapolate that? I did want this to include the heater, which you know I got vetoed on this information, but there's much more area that will be impacted with this MBTA zoning. And you can already see it on School Street and Pleasant Street and you know, the high school. So all of these areas are within that half mile that will have to be subject to the zoning. So um, I, I think this is a good step, but my concern from the beginning of this project was it's not addressing the half mile that we are going to need to undertake and look at the parking issues in the next year. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Christina. And, and to that point, I would say that um, if there's information that you all can give us about what some of those potential zoning districts might look like, you know, that will give our data services team the opportunity to dig in on those when it comes to modeling the type of scenario that I was talking about earlier. You know, we, I think we can make some educated guesses on, on our end, but the more that you can sort of provide us with some of those parameters to, to do that analysis, I think that, that would help us out. So if there are you know, specific geographies or even you know, if we could localize it on 
a census tract level that can help us think about this this model in a little bit more more detail. So um, I appre appreciate the point because I understand that you know some of the more more suitable multifamily multifamily housing sites in Manchester might not be right near the MBTA stop. They might be maybe a little adjacent or a little further off. So we want to make sure that we're reflecting that in our final analysis and scenario development. That's it. A um, couple of comments. Um, I was heavily involved in a traffic study in Winchester, Winchester Center, which, which has two train stations into Boston, um, a quarter of a mile from each other, um, as well as a significantly larger town center than Manchester. And what we found in the study was that um, Merchants wanted to park in front of their stores. Um, the employees wanted to park within a reasonable distance. And those were all parking spaces that should have been for patrons. And so what we did was we found remote parking spaces um, within a five to 15 minute walk of the downtown. And we designated that, those spaces for free. So, if you were an employee of a business, you could park 10 minutes away and walk, which it's only a pain in, in the rain, but you could park in a remote location and um, you wouldn't have to move your car. You wouldn't have, you wouldn't get a ticket. You were designated for that spot and it freed up a lot of parking spaces in the downtown. And um, it was a very successful result by doing that. So it's something that I will talk with Greg about to take a look at remote parking spaces because I think that is one of the answers to the issue. Thank you, uh, Greg. We haven't heard from you. Yeah, thanks, Ron. Um, I just want to um, just underscore that that this, this study really is a multi-board and committee study. And that certainly having the planning board's input and, and guidance is critical. Um, but we also have a number of other boards and committees that are engaged and are giving input. Um, so I, I don't think we need to disparage the effort um, that it is going forward and that this is an opportunity um, for the board, for the planning board to give very substantial an important input. Um, it's not, this is a status report. It's not the end report, as Adi has indicated. Um, there's, there's, you know, three more months of work. So if there are additional thoughts and additional recommendations that you feel need to be highlighted, this is the time to bring those forward. So, uh, so don't be shy and, uh, and let, let your thoughts be known. And this can be a, a good report that we can all feel good about. Thanks, Greg. Uh, Kathy, Alana. Uh, yeah, just uh, just to amplify exactly what uh, Greg just said, um, it is a multi-board effort. My only point, and I agree with Christina, it's absolutely the planning board's responsibility to conduct studies. My concern is is also what one of the ones that Christina mentioned that sometimes our well-intentioned boards and committees, we can all um, do things a little out of sequence um, that can cause some inefficiencies when it's time to make decisions on recommendations. So Greg, I, I do think it would be valuable for you and, and Betsy to kind of think through, right? What is the sequence of presentations or joint meetings that need to be held uh, when this final report is ready to come to light? Because if we do things in an, in an optimal sequence, we can get to decisions faster and, and that will ultimately be better for the town. Thank you. Um, Molly? Yes, thank you very much for taking my last point. I wanted to note that when we uh, initiated this study, we did it in uh, conversation with Sue Brown, who at the time was the head of the planning board. We offered to take the study off the table as a result of the fact that it got voted in that Adi 
and the um, the study was going on. Sue encouraged and asked us to stay in because the Adi study was not going to talk to the downtown merchants. So I just wanted to let you know that the downtown improvement committee did not do this except in conversation with Sue as the head of the planning board at the time. So just just so that's on the table with everyone. Thank you. Ron, we need to clarify that. I'm really sorry. And um, Marlene, this is not against you. It's just the governance that this town is a little dysfunctional. Sue Brown was and never has been the head of the planning board. The planning board is a group of seven elected officials. Sue was the town planner. So she was not the head of the planning board. And that's where the concern is. I think just, you know, conversation with the planning board, this is what we think we're doing. Do you have any comments? Do you have any other questions on the input? Like it never came in front of us. And we are the voted elected officials of the town. So that's where I'm seeing there's a bit of a disconnect. And I do want to applaud your work, but I haven't seen the questions or the survey. So I guess maybe still keeping us in the loop hasn't happened. So that's just my high level concern. And I'm asking the town select board Greg to maybe help close these loops and clarify what people's roles are here and responsibilities. That's it. Thank you, Marlene. I do appreciate your help and work. Okay, thank you. Very helpful. Laura. So I have a question. Um, when we get to the recommendations part of the report, I'm interested in um, pros and cons of uh, charging for any parking, both as a potential source of revenue and as a, a you know, traffic demand and behavior management tool. Uh, you know, Betsy made the point about remote parking as being one possibility. And I don't know if there are, now that things are mostly app-based and you don't have to actually go and install, you know, parking meter posts everywhere. It seems like the technology has gotten simpler. On the other hand, I know somebody's still got to manage it. So are there kind of rules of thumb about what size, you know, towns are, um, that this makes sense for, or what kind of parking demand that you're trying to, um, uh, manage you, but it's not a conversation that we've had yet. And if we're talking about recommendations for um, how to manage both the perceived demand and the actual demand for spaces, um, it would be really, I'd be very interested to find out more about um, the potential for use of um, charging for parking through some app or some other measure like that. Sure, um, I think there's a few different pieces to tease out there um, with respect to whether towns comparable to Manchester by the sea have or haven't implemented um, parking meters or, or charging for on street parking. I don't know of examples offhand, but that's something that we, we could look into a bit more if you are interested in kind of what other municipalities that might be comparable have or haven't done. I think at a high level, I would say, um, you know, the pros, um, certainly with when you put in parking meters, that would encourage more parking turnover. If you if you have a problem where people are parking for extended durations and you want to free up spots on a more regular basis, I think, um, you know, parking meters could certainly help with that. But I don't necessarily know that that's the challenge that you all are confronting in downtown Manchester right now. And then of course, like, as you mentioned, um, you know, it could be a, a revenue stream for the town and you could think about ways that that revenue could be reinvested in the downtown if you want to think of a measure like a parking benefit district or, or something like that. So those I would say were some of the, the pros, um, you know, the cons of course are, you know, the cost and, and management of that system you know, would mean you, know, you need more parking enforcement in that sense, as I understand it right now, the enforcement is seasonal, it would mean so that would mean you need more dedicated um, parking enforcement capacity. And then of course, there's the political um, side of the equation in, in terms of how residents and businesses um, might not often might not always have the best uh, response to um, parking meters. So then that's more of a political uh, question. But I would say at a high level, those would be some of the considerations on both the pro and the con side, as well as what um, parking meters can help you accomplish in terms of goals of increasing uh, turnover and things like that. So I hope that's helpful at a high level. Yeah, that's yeah there's helpful. Certainly more we can dig in those, details. There's a table or something that can go into the report that sort of talks about the pros and cons, because we did consider this. I don't know that we're, I mean, this is 
is way ahead, but you know we might consider it for some areas, but not others. And um, if there are smaller towns that have um, tried this, given the way things are moving towards an app-based system, that would just be interesting information to have for context. Thank sure, you. We can look into that. All right, um, anything else? Otherwise, I think we'll wrap this up and um, maybe I'll put it on our agenda for the night to discuss any more things that we want to have Addie put in the report. I think that's useful. I can put that on the agenda. Um, otherwise, uh, thank you, Addie, uh, for uh, coming tonight. Um, and we look forward to your report. And hopefully, you can incorporate some of the comments you heard tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll, I'll definitely take all, all this back and I'll, I'll look forward to um, coming back before you all in February when we are closer to having that final report done. And I'll be working with Betsy in the interim to get us there. So feel free to reach out to her or to me with any um, questions or comments that come up from here on out. So thanks again for your time and uh, have a good evening, everyone. All right, Thank you. Okay, um, I don't think we have time for curb cut regulations, plus Mary isn't here, so I think I'm just going to get over that, and then I think we've covered everything else on the agenda, so I would take a motion to adjourn unless somebody has anything they'd like to bring up. Happy New Year. Happy, yeah, happy holiday. Happy, happy New Year. We'll see you in January. Take a nice rest from this. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Is it seconded? Seconded. Roll call, Laura? Yes. 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 Christina? Yes. See you next year. Okay. Thank you.